So the title of this session was Melbourne, World's Most Livable City. And perhaps I, I should have framed that better. Um, uh, neither of you touched on that. It was maybe the third speaker's job to do that. But, you know, so, so as I understand it, Melbourne keeps coming top of these world rankings as most livable city. Uh, for those people out of town, if you're not aware of that, I want to know why. I, and, and I actually would like to know why. I don't, I don't well, it came top of the McKinsey data. I, you know, why is it the world's most livable city? I'd like to hear from the three people who live here. Those surveys are mostly based around a set of criteria about design for employees and international employees even to sort of allocate their employees here and the sort of life they're going to have. And so in that sense, Melbourne is very good. And so if you are a well-paid um, employee of a big corporation, you can live very well in Melbourne. But the Economist survey, at least, isn't looking and wasn't designed to and doesn't pretend to look at the general population and how they live. And so I think if you did that, you might find some slightly nuanced um, results. And the other thing is, it isn't just about design. It's far from being about design. It's more about number of schools, number of hospital beds, how easy it is to get to the beach, maybe all that sort of thing. Um, so Melbourne does rate well on, on, on a lot of those factors for most people. But it is, it is not everything and doesn't cover all facets. Uh, well, Melbourne is obviously a great place and why anyone would live anywhere else is beyond me, really. Um, uh, but what Larry said about the economists, uh, the, the methodology that they use is absolutely true. So while everyone's very proud of it, um, if we lost that ranking uh, next week, would that be the end of Mel what's great about Melbourne? Uh, not really. Um, it, it's a great place. It's been a great place for a long time. That's one of the reasons so many people come here. You know, we've got a relatively benign climate, depending on who you ask. Um, good economy, great diversity, um, lots of choice. Um, and, uh, you know, stable democratic institutions, all nice things to have. Um, and, and some, in, at least we've retained some of our, of our historical character. We're under serious pressure, though. And I think that's, if that's one message that you get from both Lara and my presentations, you know, it's the one that you should because, you know, why do I get up and go to work at Infrastructure Victoria every day is to, is to keep it great and make it better because it's not one of those things you can just accept. You can't keep, add that many more million people um, and expect that we're going to continue to have the, the livability uh, that we have without really serious... Um, planning and some difficult choices being made. We also get traffic jams in Melbourne, so we, we do, don't necessarily have a, you know, a heaven down here. Um, perhaps one of the, the criteria for which is also well known is great sport, apparently one of the criteria of classification. So the, the, this idea that the city is the most level is based on a, on a very corporate idea of moving from country to country. I would like to share some good words, however, about the design. I mean, the, the city has a very resilient grid that was created perhaps almost by chance, um, allowing very large streets to have trams. Um, uh, and then perhaps as an afterthought, we discover these things which are the laneways. And, and it, it didn't happen naturally. The city has fought through it decades by going through bum, booms and busts in order to create uh, regulations. Uh, Larry has touched on the idea of creating a continuous streetscape, uh, which was a, as a result of postmodernism. There was very much a lot of debate. Uh, certainly, it's a city that is open to migrants uh, and then has done it significantly over the last 150 years. And so this has created a, an economic environment where th the city always works through its problems. Okay, and, but again, we're certainly not the only one in the world. Vancouver is giving us a very hard time. So, oh, that's Viennese. Oh, the, and the Viennese, of course, and Sydney sort of catching up still. So we're okay. But yeah. Actually, that reminds me. Uh, you know, when I lived here, uh, I believe that Melbourne was the second largest Greek city after Athens. Is that still true? <laughs> or was that an urban myth? <laughs> 
Uh, don't know. <laughs> This issue of equity in, 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 in residential apartments, social equity, is a huge issue. It's a huge issue, you know, and, and, and as someone who has to go around the world and, and kind of semi-defend this, the reality is that these, many of these apartments that are being built in New York, London, and other places are purely safety deposit boxes for rich Chinese or rich Middle Easterners or rich Canadians or rich people who want to invest and actually will not be living there for a large part of the time. You know, if you can, especially at the super, super luxury end, if you can afford $20 million for an apartment, then you probably don't have to worry about renting it out for the 50 weeks of the year that you're not there. And it's a serious issue. Well, obviously, it's a big issue, but I, th I feel the, the, uh, that, that we gloss over it a lot. And so my honest question to you is, uh, do you feel that you really are tackling that better in Melbourne? Um, and if so, how? Uh, you know, as opposed to some, some of the other cities that I've mentioned. I mean, other places have tackled it much better than Melbourne. New York has mandatory... Um, proportions of social housing in some areas it's associated with floor area ratios. There's, I mean, there's, we introduced a fairly timid uh, sort of a bonus, a floor area uplift. Uh, one of the criteria is um, social housing. If you provide to a registered housing association a unit, um, which is tenancy blind, no one has to know about it, then you get an uplift equivalent to 10 times that um, in the building. But um, of all the six or so options for bonuses that you have in the C270 Melbourne scheme, that one has never been taken up in the year and a bit since it began. So there is not a sort of a natural tendency for developers to go that way. It's going to have to be government driven more, I believe, and government is setting targets mm -hmm. and they are certainly dedicated to doing something. Uh, and Fisherman's Bend as well, it's the same kind of um, uh, promoting the uh, established proportions of social housing. Oh, look, the only thing I'd add to that, when I talk about Infrastructure Victoria's perspective on social housing, we're talking about the most vulnerable um, members of society. And so we are um, probably less focused on the apartment design quality issue because that's not our game. Um, and more about provision of social housing, but very much of a view that there's a whole lot of different ways you can do that. And you know, Larry described one of that mix of uh, with with other developments. And the challenge, of course, is what are the ones they're going to deliver the number that you need while also being um, practical and financially feasible for those who are developing. Yes, yeah, so perhaps I can add that there's a bit of a distinction, Anthony, when you say in the luxury market. I mean, of course, w Melbourne has a bit of that too, but it's certainly very different from New York. So when you walk down today towards the top of North Elizabeth Street, you'll find that the apartment market there is more, yes, it's investment driven, but they're very small. Uh, in fact, it's, it's in a high rise student living in a certain sense. There are social issues that have emerged of overcrowding. So it's not necessarily the luxury uh, end, but certainly it's an investment driven end that is not taking care of, of a, a living in high rise. So it's not taking care of the, the families that might be willing to have a more urban living, and, and certainly it's not taking care of social housing. Um, perhaps the answer may rely, and I'm, I'm just you know, now hearing from Jonathan, in, in the medium rise area of the, the five to six stories, in, in servers that we, we already enjoy, which perhaps are the ones that, that make uh, the, the, the city livable. It's, it's the proximity to the CBD, um, access to universities and, and choices of, of good lifestyle that, that are not necessarily the high rise apartment living which may be applicable for other parts of the world, but Melbourne, Melbourne's history in Hara has been a history of tall buildings for offices, which apparently are coming back. So perhaps not a bad thing. What are the environmental benefits of building a high rise versus a few story building? Anthony, maybe you can give us insight on that, actually. Luckily, I am only here to facilitate the panel today. <laughs> so I'm going to 
because I have a lot of views on that, but I, I want to encourage the panel. Larry, do you have a view on that? I think um, compared to a two-storey building, um, there are obvious benefits in going denser than a two-storey building. If you're talking more about um, Georgia's six to eight to ten storey building, that is probably a sweeter spot in terms of the sustainability and getting the densities we need. Um, whereas at the top end of the high rise scale, over 200 metres, that really isn't being always very efficient at all. It's not always about efficiency, it's about being special and as a marketing element almost. So certainly you wouldn't be building the city all over 200 metres tall to be efficiently cramming people in. It is somewhere more in the middle. I mean, I, I would just add to that. It, you know, it depends on the, on the scale of the issue. Yeah? And actually, in the two presentations you gave, there were a number of factors that struck me um, quite markedly. I mean, you're saying that Melbourne's going to go to 8 million people, yeah? What, what's, it's 2 million at the minute, is it? What is it? Five. Okay, going from 5 to 8 million people. It's almost a doubling of population. You know, we're not seeing that typically in westernized developed cities. You know, well, I live in Chicago. We're seeing a, a movement away from Rust Belt to Sun Belt, you know, and we're not seeing, I mean, that really puts this city in the same camp as many cities in the developing world that are really seeing huge population growth. So, so you know, I don't know that, that the four to six story uh, building type is the answer, you know, a, 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 against that backdrop. At the same time, I think, um, you know, just building a, 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 a super tall building that doesn't necessarily embrace all sectors of society is the answer, I, answer either. But just to answer that lady's question briefly, we just produced a, 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 the results of a two-year research project um, comparing people living in high-rise buildings against suburban, uh, suburban districts outside Chicago, based on very real data, energy bills, and the high-rise building consumed more energy per square foot than the low-rise building. The people living downtown, the people living downtown drove 9% greater distance by automobile than the people living in suburbia. Yeah? And, and, but the reason for this is there were no families living downtown. So this data, like travel distance in the suburban area, was divided by five people living in a house. In the high rise, it was one and a half rich retired people living in these buildings. So their demographics are completely different. You know, you're not comparing apples to apples. But the main benefit was this. Those people living out in suburbia required 833% of the physical infrastructure to support their inhabitation than the people living downtown on a linear length per person basis. And that really is the, for me at least, is the key. We need to do the best that we can with buildings, but it's really about concentrated land use and share of space and infrastructure that the real benefits of, of high rise buildings, which is why I'm not, I don't know that the four to six story building is enough when you're looking at a, a doubling of your population. Except that in Melbourne, we have a relatively small area for the high rise and a huge area of low rise. If you can somehow change the market and the regulations so that, that huge area can even increase double marginally, if you've put a large, huge number of people into the city straight away in a very quick space of time, whereas to do it through very intense and very few small areas is a lot of work. Um, just quickly, I just want to get your comment on urban habitat around high-rise buildings, purely and simply having recently tra travelled to Vancouver and noticing the streetscape of these high-rise buildings they've developed there. If you could look at, say, Docklands and even South Bank, the streetscape of those buildings are very harsh. The urban habitat doesn't exist. Infrastructure for schools... Um, is not there, so people are actually having to travel, as you mentioned earlier, out of those areas to either send their kids to school. Like if you, if anybody lives in the Docklands, they, they literally have to travel from the Docklands to um, East Melbourne to send their kids to school. Um, I think we've lost the opportunity to develop the urban habitat in those areas. Uh, is that going to be addressed, say, in Fisherman's Bend better? Um, is this just a thought and opinion? Well, the framework plan for Fisherman's Bend has been very careful in doing open space studies, doing school studies, 
and working out what the density of population is going to be and trying to match those facilities with that proposed population. So the planning at least is there for Fisherman's Bend. The trouble will be the implementation because 95% plus of the land is private in Fisherman's Bend. But the planning is certainly looking at the very issues you're talking about and realising that Docklands and South Bank particularly did not foresee spaces for schools or parks uh, significant numbers. Jonathan, in Larry's presentation we saw the population is almost doubling in 30 years and the population is also aging. So 65% of the population is 65 plus. So my question to you is, when you are planning, when you're strategizing the infrastructure for 30 years, how did you factor in the age? And what are the spatial considerations you have taken for that? Yeah, good question. So um, we absolutely did because you're, um, I mean, this is not just unique to, to Victoria, but um, the number of other um, uh, situations across the world where you've got this challenge. Um, and so we looked at the health sector, but we didn't just look at the health sector when we were looking at, at ageing. Um, so part of it was, um, in terms of the health sector, you're going to have increasing demand placed on um, a sector that's already under demand and already taking a vast amount of the state and federal budget. Um, and so infrastructure is only a piece of a solution to that. Um, one important piece is um, the uh, ICT elements of um, health service delivery and making that really well. The other one, at almost at the other end of the spectrum, is dealing with some of the planning constraints about people's capacity to age in place and um, the um, capacity to develop appropriate um, residences for people so they don't have to leave their entire neighbourhoods um, and families and move to uh, some old person's home, some institutional arrangement, but rather the, um, you know, there being greater capacity to actually develop those. Then sort of stepping a little bit further away, something we've certainly thought about is universal design and the application of universal design for buildings generally and the public transport system in particular. Um, and that um, while retrofitting that takes time and money, starting to do that now is a very good investment when you look at the change in the demographics um, of people in this state. See, I mean, I have seen Mumbai's growth and uh, it has grown enormously and I have seen your data also that the city is growing from 5 million to about, uh, uh, you know, 9.5 million, 9.8 million in uh, uh, next few years. So, uh, so what are the special infrastructural measures that, uh, you know, Melbourne is taking to cater to this growth? Because the land in the city is going to remain the same, the street sizes are going to remain the same, you know, uh, probably the vertical developments will go more and the density will increase in the same land parcel. Um, I have seen a lot of stress coming on, you know, when it comes to, you know, the city like Mumbai or Delhi in terms of the traffic, in terms of the congestion, in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, the water and the sanitation, all those things. So what are the modern things, what are the next generation things that this city is thinking to, you know, keep it stacked that it's the most livable in the next uh, decade or next, uh, uh, you know, uh, three decades? Um, I'll, I'll certainly start and the other guys might have something to add. Um, so you raise a really good question. There's some fascinating stuff coming straight towards us quite fast. Um, and um, some of those, it's a combination of technology and regulatory change. Um, the best like, example I can give you um, is probably the combination of um, increasingly automated vehicles as part of the fleet that are increasingly low emission and done the right way, that can be fantastic, that can be really interesting because you actually, um, uh, you, the amount of road space that you need and the efficiency with which you can um, move, get people around can increase and you can and actually you get much more flexibility in how you can use land in a very small, you know, in a compact space like the city. If you accompany it with great mass transit systems as well and probably if you accompany it with appropriate incentives so that people are using 
those sort of ways of getting around in the most efficient way. So if everyone has got their own automated vehicle and it's driving them alone to work in the city and then dropping them off and driving back home, well, guess what? Our road network just got completely ruined. Um, on the other hand, if you have um, you know, the right price signals, the right sharing of those vehicles, they're being used appropriately and it means you can um, uh, combine that with a really good public transport system and you can free up some um, land that you would otherwise be using for parking for more efficient and better yield uses and more flexible uses, that could be a really fascinating way of, of squeezing more out of an increasingly dense city. Sorry, I've got one sub-question to this. Is when we say 9.8 million and how you're going to restrict it to 9.8, suppose it becomes 12, it becomes 14. Because, you know, these cities which, uh, which has got a very good livability standard, they attract a lot of migrating population, which is the problem of my city, you know. And, uh, uh, I mean, do you discourage the migrating population to coming to, uh, you know, this city? by doing something which makes the life of these citizens happier, merrier? Uh, yeah, well, I don't think the answer is to make it a worse place to live and therefore drive them away. <laughs> um, there, there's a, and there's a couple of challenges there, um, at least in an Australian context. Um, one is that Australia is you know, generally welcoming, as, as Giorgio said, to, to migrants from other countries, particularly those who bring great skills and that's particularly relevant actually when you've got an aging workforce as your your colleague was was pointing pointing out in terms of that that change um, and the other thing is um, that we're not going we're not able even even if you restrict migration you can't restrict interstate migration um, and so yeah that's right and so you get a lot of that and we of course have seen that in terms of our settlement pattern, patterns in Victoria where a lot of the smaller towns and rural areas people have moved either rural cities or to, to Melbourne. One of the, th the, the issues that is playing out at the moment in Melbourne and, and the Victorian, the Victoria generally is, um, can you distribute a greater amount of our population to regional centres, of which we have, you know, three or four large regional centres, um, and can you do that in theory and can you do, do it in practice? So can you get the transport systems to work? Can you have the jobs there and the lifestyle that people really want? Um, and I've got to say that's an open question that we're giving a lot of thought to. You know, I, 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 I'd like to just uh, raise another point. So over the last several days that we've been in Sydney, one of the things that's really impressed me with Australia, and I, I should add the caveat that I've lived in America for 11 years now, so it might be slightly tempered by this, but you know, in, in America, you know, Everybody seems so scared by anything to do with regulation, by government. You know, there's just such a distrust that the government could do anything right, either at state or federal level. And so, you know, we, we heard the Minister for State at, in New South Wales, and we had heard from Monica Brony, who's the CEO of the City of Sydney. And, and it seems to me that, 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 you know, Australia's got so much right in terms of striking that balance between regulation and incentive like in sydney this idea of the design competitions and forcing that you know if it's a major project there's a there's there's got to be four four design proposals or something but if you do it and you take that on board then there's a 10 percent gfa bonus and I, I mean these things i think are, are, are really great is that happening in melbourne that kind of thing happening in melbourne as well that's linking the development to the design quality in such a direct way uh, there isn't the same kind of design competition um, obligatory system here. There have been in recent times quite a few design competitions run by, how will I say it, enlightened developers and institutional developers, um, but they were not um, controlled by the state or the council. There is discussion and the City of Melbourne is very keen to promote that discussion about going more down the Sydney pathway. Um, from what I've heard and what I understand of the Sydney system, we have to be careful to be efficient about it. Otherwise, it can take considerable time. But it is um, a, certainly an excellent sort of way to go. And I'm sure Melbourne will be investigating more. 
maybe two more general thoughts. The first thought, of course, is I can't understand why did people in the US would have that view about politics. Um, I'm perplexed by that. <laughs> um, s second thing, though, um, you know, Australia does have a, less, a far less extreme uh, drift towards that um, tendency of, of uh, when you look at the surveys of um, you know trust in government um, and that's certainly heading that way but nowhere near as extreme and one of the reasons infrastructure Victoria was created is to some degree to take the politics out of infrastructure now um, you never will and nor should you ever entirely take politics out of infrastructure but one of the reasons we exist is to have that greater amount of transparency and evidence base and, and medium to long term planning um, so that you at least you can have a de greater degree of certainty and pipeline as to what is coming up. Um, Anthony, it, in fact, my perception of Melbourne in terms of regulation is actually of a fairly highly deregulated environment. Um, so you probably are aware or not, but say the history of the city is such that in the 1950s <coughs> there was a building height uh, cap of 132 feet, right? That was by law, there was a code, it was prescribed, and yet the city built its first modernist tower, ICI House, which is part of the Tours Tomorrow, which is double that height. Because there was a mechanism in the regulations that allowed to negotiate. Mm. If it was against the course of business, well, let's talk about it. Um, so actually, there is a very flexible history about dealing with height in this city. Um, as a paradox today, I think the biggest limitation of building height is a small regional airport, which is Essendon, which is restricting the height to, correct me if I'm wrong, 250 meters. Depends on the area and the landing paths, etc. Not Tullamarine, that's a smaller regional airport. But there is no uh, limit to height in itself. Um, however, in recent times, and that was part of Larry's presentation today, we did realise that that deregulation wasn't really doing a great job, particularly in some areas, and which is why now there's a return to, OK, let, let's control it a bit more. Let, let's bring back the, the plot ratio. Let's talk about, again about setbacks, because in that environment, a few things have been lost.